Hello friends and welcome back to my shop. This is going to be a hard video not to ramble about because I'm jazzed about it. My lathe. It's a simple lathe, works great, I'm very happy with it. Lathes operate in a ZX coordinate system if you want to think of it that way. Uh, basically you can move the carriage one way and another way. Two directions, closer to the work and into the work. Um, and that lets you do a heck of a lot. Uh, you can do all kinds of weird shape turning, you can do threading, you can do just general turning. But you don't have that last axis, at least on this particular lathe, I don't have that last axis. And there's a million ways to add more axes to a lathe. But a mill, right out of the gate, has three axes. You have X, Y, Z. Um, so if you ever use your mill as a lathe, you essentially take the end mill out of the spindle and put your work in the spindle, you now have a lathe with an extra axis. Um, and with that extra axis, you can use it to move to different coordinates, essentially moving the work to different working positions. So if you clamp a bunch of cutting tools to the bed of the lathe, where normally you would clamp your stock that you would mill, you can now move your stock from position to position and essentially have a tool changing lathe just in a different form factor. While I could do it on my little tag lathe here, uh, just the same, the positional or the positioning system on this is just simple ball screws, or not simple ball screws, it's simple stock screws, just your regular, uh, I think these are quarter 20 left hand thread screws. Um, I've built custom bronze bushings for them to, to reduce the backlash even more so, um, but just due to the size of it, it's very hard to get proper ball screws onto this system. I mean, you can use trapezoidal screws and anti-backlash nuts. There's ways I can make it better for sure. But my mill sitting right there has double nut ball screws on it, um, which have like a less than a thou of mechanical backlash, roughly a thou of backlash, uh, which in my land is is pretty good. It's easy to compensate with that, that with software. So I have like essentially a highly accurate lathe just in a vertical form factor. So I decided to do mill turning on it. I've done mill turning before. I did mill turning years ago. These little brass pen bodies. Um, I would just clamp a tool in the vise of my mill and just kind of batch out like 10 or 20 of these and then call it done. I wanted to have a system where I could use it and have multiple tools and then still get it out of the machine because my, my mill isn't very big. I don't have a lot of working space. So everything has to be able to come in and out. And uh, I've had this idea in my head for the longest time to build a gang tooling fixture. And that's what I finally built. And it works phenomenal. So this is the premise of the fixture. A uh, bunch of tools clamped in. I made this kind of aluminum riser business. Uh, and then I have another tool here that does my internal threading. Uh, and then I can add a bunch more drills or whatever I want along this back edge. These two uprights, uh, before you watch any of the, I'm gonna link a video below that explains mill turning. And if you're at all interested in doing mill turning, um, this video, the one I'm gonna link below is phenomenal. It's, I, I found it years ago and I, I must, I probably watched it a dozen times by now. He explains everything nice and detailed, the exact way that I'm doing it. Um, it's a quick, concise video. Um, I'll link it below. Watch that. 
then come back here because it'll give you a much better understanding of exactly how I'm doing this. Um, so anyways, two uprights here and I machined both these pieces and then I milled them right on the fixture plate so I know that these two surfaces are dead parallel to the, uh, to the mill. I then put this cross brace on and everything was kind of milled in place uh, to make everything as repeatable as I possibly could. You could see that this giant block, um, this piece and this piece are bolted together um, with all the tools and everything. So this whole assembly can come off of these two risers. It has to because you can see I have my fourth axis behind here and it's blocking my fourth axis where I would normally do the cutting for the, the bodies on the pen, the little J slots. So I have to find a way to get this off and then put back on fairly repeatedly. The mill will home itself and then I have all these set as work offsets. So if I can get this back in the same position or even incredibly close where I can just at least maybe just touch off one tool, then I'll know relatively where everything else is. Um, so I did my best to make it as repeatable as I could and to do that. So once I machined it, I drilled these two aligning holes uh, and then I reamed them and basically they go through the top piece and then they go into the bottom and they're sized for uh, quarter inch dowel pins or end mills and they're a uh, they're a very tight fit like very tight <laughs> um, so basically what I do is I take I was gonna put permanent dowel pins in here and I realize there's there's no reason they have to be permanent so I put a pin in here and I put a pin in here um, and that lets me align it exactly or as close as I humanly possibly can right now and then I just bolt it down and then once it's all secure I just pull these out uh, and that's fairly repeatable. I've tested it, I've taken it on and off a few times now and I haven't had to retouch off any of the tools so it's probably as accurate as my homing switches on this mill are um, which is good enough right now for my purposes. I'm hitting my tolerance, most of my, most of my tolerances on a lot of the turning operations are about maybe plus minus five tenths on uh, on most of the IDs and stuff. Um, so roughly about a thou, um, not give or take, but a thou range. Uh, and I seem to be hitting that. So I'm fairly happy with the way it turned out. Uh, it actually turned out a lot better than I expected it to. Uh, the tools, nothing fancy. They're just clamped down. There's there's screws that come on either side here. So these this block, this block, and this block are fixed. Uh, and these blocks are floating. And basically what I do is I have these loose. Uh, I put whatever tools I want in here. They're sized for a quarter, 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 and then three or five sixteenths or something. Because that's what this, this is a micro 100 threading tool and it's just, it's a little bit bigger. It's the smallest one I could get. But anyways, um, so I put these in loosely and then there's set screws on the back side here that push everything together um, just lightly. And then I snug these down. And that way everything is fairly constrained. Um, for the size of cuts I'm taking, even when I dumb thumb it and take way bigger cut than I plan to, um, it's still uh, nothing moves. So that's that's ideal. Um, this tool is just held in with a couple set screws. Ideally, I should have screws coming in this way against the flat, but it just didn't work out. I could change the code so that the machine would run the... It was just more annoying, so I just spun the tool, tightened it in, and uh, everything seems to be very happy. I've ran this a few times now to do threading on... I've done both uh, internal work on stainless, external work on stainless, and uh, external work on titanium. I haven't actually done internal work on titanium, but titanium machines better than stainless, so um, fits are great, which is awesome, because now I just put work in here. Uh, you actually see in the video, I was using this headstock with, uh, with my standard Tormach TTS system holding 3 8 shanks. Uh, but just a lot of stack up and there's a little bit more area for error to build up in here. So I've just gone to a standard 3 8 call it right into the R8 taper uh, to hold the work. And that uh, that increases rigidity by getting me closer to the spindle bearings. Um, lets me hold longer work, but I don't really need that aspect of it. And it just keeps everything a little more concise. Uh, so I can go from my 5C on the lathe from drilling right into here and there's, a, there's almost no run out or enough that it's taken up for the, uh, the amount of stock that I have to basically true up. So yeah, works very well. So another really useful thing about using the mill now instead of my lathe is the rapid speed is significantly higher. Uh, normally on my mill, I was limited to threading at about 500 RPM just because the carriage couldn't keep up with the thread. The mill can keep up. I mean, it can wrap it at like a hundred plus 200 inches per minute. Uh, so it can keep up with any spindle speed it can currently spin at. 
I don't want to thread that fast particularly, uh, but what it does let me do is it helps a bunch in doing an operation called a Higby thread or a blunt start thread. I've wanted to do this forever, for a really long time. A Higby thread, I'll put some pictures up. The end of a, a fire hose connection or sometimes your garden hose connections will have a Higby thread, which essentially is, is it takes the sharp part of the thread away um, and starts when the thread hits its full depth. That's normally done in situations where you don't want a cross thread, um, i.e. fire hoses. You want them to go together really quickly. Especially with small fasteners like the ones I use, um, or small thread pitches, uh, these are 40 threads per inch, which are fairly easy to cross thread um, if, you're, if you're not paying attention. I mean, it's not, you'll, you'll definitely feel it. It's, it's not that easy, but you know what I mean. It's much nicer if they go together perfectly, and the best way to do that is with a Higby thread. John Saunders, uh, NYCCNC, I'll put another link below to his video. He has a great explanation on how to do a Higby thread on a CNC lathe, and that's the exact uh, method I used for this, and it came out perfect. So the other reason I didn't do this right off the jump is the mill, or the way this mill comes, there's no way to tell where the spindle is, and that's really important to do any kind of decent amount of mill turning. Uh, just like on my lathe, you have to know the speed at which everything is spinning and at what clock it is. So you have to have an index, essentially like a pulse per rotation, so you know to start a thread, you have to always start at the same point, or multi-threading or whatnot. But uh, one night when I was walking, I figured out I could probably just hack the stock system in here and then put a simple indexing system with like a Hall effect, similar to what I did on my lathe, and it would be minimal amounts of work. So that's what I did. So this is where everything works out. Uh, this is a little sensor that picks up the hole positions in this disc and that determines the RPM. And on the back side here, uh, you can see just a little black cable uh, that detects these little magnets here that are pressed in here and here. And that gives me the index for the spindle. And with those two things, I can do threading on the mill now. And that, once again, brings us to the end of another week. What I'm going to do now is use my new gang tooling fixture jig thing, Turnomatic, uh, to do a bunch of pen bodies, uh, doing a much bigger batch than last time. Uh, thank you again to everybody who purchased my very small batch in very, very, very short amount of time. Um, I'm super grateful. Um, I'm happy to release them into the world, and I'm happy to uh, get a little bit larger of a batch so they, uh, they don't go away so quickly. So that's what I'm going to work on now. More video next week, and until then, I'll see you guys later. Take care. Bye.